Um, yeah, so I, I just did a talk uh, in the other room. So um, it, it may, may take some time for me to get used to uh, this room and uh, a new talk. <laughs> Usually you will have some time between <laughs> to prepare, but it's, uh, we'll see. Um, this is a, a, f a subject that is uh, very familiar as well as dear to me. So um, uh, yeah, we'll have some fun anyway. Uh, hexagonal architecture, it's all about this uh, nice little shape, the hexagon. And uh, the subtitle, message-oriented software design, that, that is just uh, me trying to, to look smart, you know, so don't take that too serious. Um, it's about architecture, software architecture. And if I'm talking about hexagonal architecture, you might wonder if there is something wrong with uh, any other architecture out there. So why does it have to be hexagonal? And um, this starts with the question, uh, what's really the problem uh, with most application architectures out there? Uh, so, many applications, like I'm, I'm sure you know this, uh, they start out as a nice app, a nice application. So, uh, at first, you uh, maybe you can work on a product alone, you can decide everything about it, and you can make it just as nice as you want it to be, and then maybe some people join your team, and you start looking for some rules uh, to, to make sure that the structure isn't lost over time. But still, many people on the team think about it in different ways. And uh, at some point, this, this often results in what I call a sad app. So this is about dependency directions going all over the place. Uh, everybody, whenever they need something, they just grab it from some place uh, entirely different within the application. And that's just really a bad thing. And mainly because, well, of course, your brain can't handle such, such, a, r such a mess. Um, so you start putting the same kinds of things in the same kinds of places with the same names. Uh, for example, according to uh, MVC structure. So uh, you put everything rela related to entities inside a directory called model. And then you put everything related to views, like maybe some view models or some templates, in one directory called view. And then you have, of course, your controllers. And you put everything that has controller in its name in the controller directory. Mm. Not sure if this is a, a sufficient way of grouping your code, like by type of things. Uh, but it is, in fact, the way that many frameworks, or at least framework documentation authors, uh, try to convince you to do things. And that's the problem. So many of the code out there, many of the applications, are very much coupled to the framework that they have used uh, as, as the foundational layer for their application. This is very apparent if you look at the way that people start working on projects. So first of all, usually you, you just pick a framework. Like you, you sit down with some colleagues and you decide upon the framework to use. Then you install a skeleton project, maybe a demo project, but then you remove the demo stuff, of course, since you, don't, since you won't need it. Uh, you may start generating or auto-generating uh, some entities and maybe even some CRUD-based controllers. And you're done. And you call this project a symphony project. This is in fact completely outside in. The actual boring stuff, or what I call the boring stuff, is about the frameworks that you use, like Symphony or Doctrine uh, for storing things, RabbitMQ for sending messages onto a queue, uh, Redis for storing some caching things, and Angular maybe on the front end. I don't know. But all of these technical decisions uh, about particular techniques that you want to use, particular services that you want to use, um, that is actually quite boring. Of course, it is interesting in its own way, but with regard to the application, and especially with regard to the customer who is going to, uh, to pay for your application, all these things don't really matter. As long as they work, it's all fine. It's about what's inside in that core of the application. Of course, I will talk all about the core uh, in a minute. The problem with focusing on all these technological decisions is that everything uh, is will, will result in, in slow tests. So um, focusing on the web framework that you use or, the, the, for example, Doctrine as a persistence library uh, will make all of your tests very slow if you, if you take them as your starting point. Um, so if you need a browser to, to fully test your application, then that will make your tests very slow, of course. If you need an actual file system, that too is a factor that slows down your tests. Uh, and the same for an actual database. It has to be uh, created and uh, populated with some data in order to run your tests. Then 
that is uh, one big factor in making your tests very slow. Um, there are, of course, some very good solutions, which I will point you to in a minute. Um, I have always been wondering why don't frameworks solve this kind of thing for us? Of course, if you use Doctrine, there is uh, a way to substitute the, the really slow MySQL database with some SQLite database, which will make things a bit faster in your test scenarios. But why is it, isn't it possible to take that last step and um, have frameworks help you make your tests as, as fast as they can be? Well, the problem is they really can't. Uh, or maybe it's not a problem, it's just something that you have to know about the world. Because frameworks are actually all about encapsulation. Um, <laughs> this is a nice image of what encapsulation is about. All those details, the stars, they are behind a layer of sort of, well, uh, encapsulation. So all the details, they are hidden from sight. Um, looking back at some, some pretty old, uh, old school or old style PHP code, this is the way that you can um, take the content from an, H from an HTTP request and uh, find out the content type that was used or that was sent, <coughs> sent uh, as a header. And then we're well, doing some JSON decoding of the data or maybe some XML uh, decoding from the same data if the, if the content type was different. Um, nowadays, we get all kinds of libraries and, and framework tools that uh, allow you to do things like this. So you can just call a serializer uh, to deserialize the request content and uh, based on the content type. So that nicely hides all kinds of details about uh, what's going on under the hood. And the same goes for the way that we talk to databases. Um, so this is the way that it's, it's really done in a low level way. So we use PDO here to create uh, a statement, to bind some values, to execute the statement, and then fetch the results in, um, well, in the form of um, a result arrays, associative arrays. And then maybe we create, uh, in this case, uh, patient objects representing a particular patient uh, based on well, the data in that array. Nowadays, we don't have to do all these things. We have uh, libraries like Doctrine ORM, and then we can create a query builder, uh, supply some where something is something data, and then get a query and get a result. So this still hides uh, most of the details about the database communication, uh, because even the fact that PDO has been used is, is, is completely hidden from sight. Um, and all the details about uh, which kinds of databases need different ways of talking to it, well, it's all hidden for you. But what about abstraction? Going to some more generic way of looking at things. Uh, this is still very concrete. We are still talking about a query, uh, a result, uh, and this, this really sounds very much like uh, a database. Uh, even the where uh, anonymous equals true, that is something that's, that's very specific to, um, to database talk. If we would really try to find some abstract way of talking about uh, getting patients or collecting patients, recollecting patients, then we would ha talk about a repository, which is just uh, a holder of objects, of patient objects. And we would have a method, anonymous patients, which would give us all the patient objects uh, if we need them. And this is really abstract, and this is also very nice. But of course, frameworks themselves, they cannot supply this for you, so you have to do it yourself all the time. Um, a more serious problem with uh, all the framework-specific uh, code is that it's usually very much coupled to the delivery mechanism itself. So looking at uh, a very, well, uh, common uh, piece of code, like the register patient action in this case, we can see that uh, this is highly coupled to the way that the, the, the data is being delivered, so the delivery mechanism. Uh, because we're using a request object and a form, which is very much web-specific, and then we use an entity manager, which is part of the ORM, uh, and th this is very much relational database-specific. Right, so this is just one particular way in which the data is able to flow inside our application and to the outside again. Um, this poses several problems. So reusability is completely impossible. If we would like to run the same functionality or the same code uh, from the command line interface, for example, that's not possible. So this is all very much web-specific code. We need a request object, we need a form object, and we need to do some, ma some magic with it. So it's completely impossible to do the same thing from the command line interface. Then the same goes for uh, running that same functionality again and again. So say we have uh, a way to register patients uh, in a batch uh, operation. 
So we have some file delivered to us, we want to parse it and then uh, well, do anything that's needed to register a patient. Right? This is completely impossible. You cannot just uh, uh, execute the same controller in a loop or you have to create a request object and again and again. And particularly if you're on the command line, you don't want to mess with, with that kind of uh, object. So that's, that's unfortunate but impossible. So this will mean that you will usually just copy uh, some code to do the same thing in a loop. Um, <coughs> some other very serious problem is that there is a lack of intention in code. So looking at the, the controller code again, then you can see that it's just really about copying data from layer to layer. Uh, from layer like the yellow to red to blue. Um, and there is no way to find out what's, what was happening before that or why did this happen in the first place. So as you can see, we get some data from the HTTP request. Then we copy that data into an entity or in fact let the form framework do this for us. And then we store that data in the database without looking at why did the, the user changes uh, and uh, what exactly changed, in fact. So we just assume that we are going to persist any change that was made to the entities themselves. Uh, this is called rapid application development. And um, yeah, you know, many people are very happy about it. And of course, it has some merit. Uh, you can very quickly deliver some applications, which does some things. And um, that, that looks very nice. But as soon as, as things become more complicated, you are out of control. You don't, you don't know um, how to, um, uh, to accomplish things because it's just about copying data and that is, there is no logic in that. So uh, in my experience, this often leads to bad application development. If you write the code like I, like I showed you before, then, well, that's, that's just a shame. Uh, so in summary, um, code is being coupled to the framework or in fact, uh, core functionality is framework specific. It's also a delivery mechanism specific. You will end up with some very slow tests and there will be uh, a lack of intention in your code. You won't be able to find out what's, what's going on there. So to find out how to improve on this is we have to go back to the essence of our application. Uh, this is what it looks like. There is the essence and then, then there is all the other things the world outside, so to say. Um, when I talk about the essence or uh, the core of the application, uh, you can also uh, substitute that by the heart of the application. And this is something that may be familiar for you, uh, a book called Domain Driven Design. Uh, the subtitle is Tackling Complexity in the Heart of Software. And when I'm talking about the essence, the core, the heart of the application, it's that heart. And Eric Evans tells us in the introduction the heart of software is its ability to solve domain-related problems for its users. And all other features, vital though they may be, support this basic purpose. So this, what I was, this is what I was telling you about um, the boring stuff on the outside, all those technological decisions uh, about dependencies and services that are being used. And then what's inside, that's the heart. That is trying to solve some real issues for your customer, some domain-related problems. So that is essential. And uh, when it comes to code, or getting back to your code, since I assume you like coding a lot like me, then there is the domain model. It's just some classes that represent your, uh, or the concepts in your domain, and also any uh, thing that can happen with those things. So any interaction that you can have with it, uh, anything that might occur. For example, there may be actions on the domain objects, and there also may be uh, events that are being processed or um, produced because of those uh, events or things that are uh, being changed. Um, together, the domain model and its interactions, uh, that constitutes its use cases. So this represents any way that a user might be able to interact with your application. And maybe a user is not the right word, but it's just any uh, actor. So it can be a, a real life user. It can also be another system which just sends requests to your application. What's on the other hand not essential? All of these things. So if you use a MySQL database or a MongoDB, well, it doesn't really matter in the end. Um, in fact, it does matter, of course, because each of these technolo technologies, technologies, they come with upsides and downsides. They have problems. Some of them are easier to maintain. Some of them, well, 
they, they just pose a problem for you uh, in your particular situation. But this is not part of the core of your application. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, or as, as cool software architects like to say, the database is an implementation detail. This is something you can just say at the office next week, if you like. All of these things, the core doesn't need to know about it. Right? It can still be a very happy core. It's not aware of any of those dirty details about what's going on uh, outside. But what about interaction? At some point, a real-life user or another existing system might want to communicate with your application. Yes, we should provide for that to happen. But in fact, the core itself, it doesn't need to know anything about this at all. It can still be its own happy self. So how do we do this? We have the core, we have the world outside, and we need a lot of things coming on uh, between them, of course. Otherwise, the application would just be some, uh, well, some nothingness hanging out there on a server. We put a layer on top of the core, and we call that layer infrastructure. It will contain code to communicate uh, through the web interface. So we allow a web browser to, to fetch something from our uh, application, or maybe j just to send a request to it to uh, initiate some, some change. Um, the same for a terminal. If our application should be reach reachable uh, via the command line, we just provide some code that allows us to do this. Uh, for messaging, if there are messages going outside of your application onto some kind of a queue or something, then uh, we need to provide some code in the infrastructure layer which communicates with that queue. Uh, the same again for a database. Well, the core doesn't know where its data is coming from or is going to, uh, but of course at some point we want to make data persistent, so we have to provide some code uh, for doing that. File system, well, that is a very concrete thing about which the core doesn't need to know anything. The core should be unsensitive to anything about directories or file permissions, anything like that. It shouldn't need to worry about that at all. Uh, and maybe email or uh, actual postal mail. Um, it should be unaware of anything that's out there. As I mentioned, an infrastructure layer is very useful. Uh, but in fact, any number of layers can be used to make sure that some deeper part of the application is being protected from outside stuff. And the good thing about layers is they allow you to separate things. Well, of course. But it's also very nice that they allow you to allocate things. If you have a layer, you just have to define some rules uh, about which things belong in that layer and which things don't. Every layer has boundaries, so it has uh, a clear point where it ends and where the other layer uh, begins. And this also means that you can define rules for crossing that boundary. So you can just say, whenever something in one layer communicates with something in another layer, I have rules for that. Uh, and rules about communication, that's really rules about dependencies. If you're going to communicate with something uh, across a boundary, you need to speak their language, so you need to provide data in their types, uh, you, need to pr you need to call objects of a certain type that you need to know of, so then that is about dependencies. And then we can apply rules like the dependency rule to uh, cross-layer communication. And the dependency rule is something mentioned in uh, an article called Screaming Architecture by Robert Martin, also known as Uncle Bob. And <coughs> he says that dependencies within such a layered architecture should only point inward. Like in this case, if you look at the diagram, uh, dependencies point uh, to deeper layers or of course to the same layer, which is more or less the same, but it can never point up to a layer that is uh, too, uh, closer to the world outside. Um, looking at these, these layer boundaries, we can ask ourselves what crosses those, those boundaries. Um, and those things that are being crossed, or that cross the boundaries, are called messages. Um, looking at a piece of code, this is what a message call might look like. So it can just be a function call, uh, and then the arguments combined with the name of the function would be the message itself. So th the application knows to who to send this message with which particular set of data. If you remodel this, this, this uh, message, um, you can also say that a message might be an object with some data in it, and then we have a generic uh, handle function maybe, or, or maybe an even a more specific handle function, 
which takes that message and processes it. Uh, what about the application boundary? There needs to be some communication with the world outside. Well, again, messages uh, travel across the application boundary itself into the application and then the application, of course, tries to make sense of it. Well, how does the application itself allow incoming messages at all? By exposing input ports. You, as a developer, uh, define the input ports of the application, saying, well, other, uh, other services or applications can communicate with me uh, through these, these ports. And if you're working with any kind of web framework nowadays, you can define routes. And these are basically input ports. You say, I allow communication to happen uh, on this URI. Uh, this the same for console commands. Having a console command means I open up my input port for you to communicate with me uh, via the command line interface. And maybe the same for uh, uh, SOAP. If you know about SOAP, then you know about the whistle file, uh, which defines the ways in which people or systems can communicate with your um, application. And this is where we get to the hexagon itself. So there it is. Because every side of the hexagon represents a particular port, whether it be an input port or an output port. So in this case, uh, we can look at the input ports. Messages are coming in through these ports. And each of the ports represents a different way of communicating with it. So I hope this doesn't disappoint you. Uh, I mean, the hexagon, that's, that's what it's all about. Um, when you ask about, well, does it have to be six sides? Mm, not sure. It, it, it's just, it, it looks nice. You know, you can, you can create these nice uh, wallpapers from it. But, of course, it, it does make sense to take um, uh, the hexagon as a shape because, uh, on average, in general, I think most applications will end up with about six ports. But if you need to write or uh, draw more ports on your application, then it's, of course, no problem to take seven sides or eight sides. Uh, this, this is just a nice looking thing. If you look at this uh, bigger diagram where you have hexagons communicating with each other, you can also see that uh, some messages going through out, uh, output ports of um, applications are actually coming into other applications via their input port. So if you have uh, like multiple services, mul multiple applications uh, in your system, then uh, you can draw this entire diagram for the whole system and see where different applications communicate with each other. So that's real nice. Um, it's good to know about ports that they, they need some kind of um, protocol to be able to talk with, uh, with each other. So each port has a language of its own. And if you think about the web port of an application, then it, of course it uses HTTP as a communication protocol. And looking at a messaging port, well, it might use AMQP for communicating. Zooming in on the hexagon a bit, we can see that um, there is, uh, for example, an HTTP message coming in, and the controller gets the message uh, in the form of a request object. It binds itself to a form, and then, well, in some way, magically, uh, an entity may be bound, or uh, uh, using a repository, maybe we have to fetch an entity, but at least uh, the, the HTTP request, the original request message, is being translated to something that the inner part of the application is able to understand. So this is really um, uh, uh, sort of like encapsulation in a, in a very big sense. The application itself hides a lot of its implementation details, uh, but it allows you to communicate in a higher level way using um, uh, like these input ports. Um, whenever you look at controllers and forms and request objects and things like that, like that these are actually called uh, adapters. So th they translate messages from the world outside to the world inside. Uh, and in fact, everything that's going on between layers, every communication that's been going on between layers, uh, has to go through some step of, of um, adaptation. It's impossible to just copy the message, the HTTP message, and let uh, your domain layer handle it. That's just too much. So everything has to be translated again and again. And th th this may be a good uh, moment to mention that uh, I didn't invent any of these ideas, uh, just like so many people don't invent anything that they present, of course. Uh, it's just repeating messages from history 
Uh, this is a particular thing that uh, Alistair Cockburn uh, invented. I must say that I think that, that there are all of these ideas also have roots in, in earlier people, uh, people's thoughts. So, well, but at least these are his words, like the hexagonal architecture and ports and adapters as an alias for hexagonal architecture. So it's good to know about this. And if you look at the slides, you can also link or click on this name and it, it will link you to a page about his, um, his ideas on this. So in summary, ports allow for communication to happen and adapters, they translate messages from the world outside. Well, looking in more detail to a piece of code that shows you what's going on when translating these messages to uh, different layers of the application, you can see that uh, what comes in is a plain HTTP message. Right? So we have a patient's endpoint here. Uh, to it, some data is being posted, like a name and an email address. And then, well, of course, PHP itself al already uh, parses that information and gives us some uh, values uh, in the superglobals. But then we create a request object based on that to further encapsulate the details about it. And finally, we create uh, what's called a command object. Um, because this is a post request, so whoever is issuing this request is basically trying to change some part of the application. It is trying to, 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 um, to, to make a change in, in the application's world. So a command is basically saying, I want you to do this. I want, I want this to change. And we take the data from the request object and we copy it into the command object. Well, about a command, it expresses intention. So it tells us what the user wanted it to do. We don't allow the form framework to, or the form component, to just copy data into entities. We explicitly say that, or we explicitly convert uh, the raw HTTP message to some intentional message. That is a command in this case, register a patient. This also implies change. So the user who created this command, they wanted to change something. And this is completely independent of the delivery mechanism. We can, re can create this command object in a web controller, but we can also create it in a console command, for example, uh, based on some of the command line options that somebody provided us. And this is only the message. So it, it isn't able to execute any functionality at all. Uh, this is just about, um, well, the intention and the data that is needed to, to process the request for change. Usually the command is being handed over to some kind of a command handler, like in this case, a register patient handler, uh, which actually does some manipulations using domain objects. It creates a patient entity in this case. Uh, it registers a new patient based on the name and the email as it is found in the command object. And then finally it adds that object to the repository. Usually you would want to um, hide the fact that, that this particular handle, handler is being called by using a command bus. Um, this is just uh, some cool ide idea, uh, which is also not new, but at least it, it gives you some, some indirection to it. So it, it removes a bit of coupling there. Uh, and if you use a tool like SimpleBus or Tactician, you can also wrap each of the command handling stuff in, in other code, uh, allowing you to log things about what's going on in your application, for example, uh, to automatically manage transactions. But that is a bit detailed for now. Uh, if you are interested in this, just uh, take a look at, um, uh, at SimpleBus, uh, at its documentation, and maybe uh, see if it's something, uh, something for you. But looking at the, the hexagon again, that's, I mean, that's wha what we're here for. We can see that um, the HTTP request is coming in through the web port. Uh, the adapter, or uh, like everything that's inside the infrastructure layer, which allows us to convert out, um, incoming messages to something that our application can understand, is uh, converted to a register patient command, in this case, a command object. And uh, the command object, or the command class itself, as well as the handler for that command are part of the application layer. So the application layer actually uh, is able to um, implement all the use cases of the application. And then in the domain layer, this is a sort of a deeper layer of the application, we will find the entity and the repository, um, which take care of, uh, well, uh, or which takes take care of um, the, um, the un underlying uh, objects, like the patient object. And the patient repository, of course, keeps the objects. Well, looking at some of the, the things that are going on at the other end of the hexagon, uh, 
we can see that if you create a patient object, like, like patient register uh, with a name and an email address, then we add that patient to the repository. And in that repository, we'd like to use, for example, uh, the doctrine ORM, um, maybe an entity manager, unit of work, anything like that, to uh, co finally convert that step into a new message, which is going uh, through an output port of our application. So looking at some of the concepts there, we have the core, it contains the patient repository, and we have the infrastructure layer uh, containing things like an entity manager class, a query builder, etc. And then finally, uh, all of these classes, they work together, or these objects, they work together to create new messages that, is a, that are able to cross the boundary uh, through the output port, like in, in this case, an SQL query. Uh, so zooming out a bit on this picture, we can see that uh, the yellow arrow, in this case, is about uh, persisting things. So this is the output port related to the database. And we can also have um, the red, or well, sort of orange port, uh, which is about messaging, and it uses AMQP to communicate. <coughs> what really often goes wrong is uh, that we easily violate boundary rules. So maybe if you noticed uh, some, uh, some problem in the previous slide, it looks sort of like this. Who sees the problem here? Yes, yes, so this violates the dependency rule, very good. Um, so the patient repository itself has dependencies on uh, infrastructure stuff, which is in a layer outside of the core, and that shouldn't be happening, right? So we said dependency rule, we want to make the dependencies pointing only inwards. Um, otherwise, we aren't decoupled anymore from, from any of the concrete details about the way that our application communicates with the world outside. Also, we need to make uh, this image a bit more detailed. So we have infrastructure on the outside uh, with all the doctrine stuff, or maybe not even doctrine stuff, but uh, ORM stuff. Um, inside of that, there is the application layer. It contains the registered patient handler. And then we have to be honest about the patient repository since it uses MySQL to store uh, its data. So uh, this is even more clear. So we have one arrow pointing inwards from the patient or the register patient handler to the repository itself. Um, but yeah, of course, still this is very much wrong. So in fact, the patient repository itself, it should be uh, in the infrastructure layer to, to be completely honest about it, its, its place. But now we have again a dependency arrow pointing outwards. Right? So we need to do something about this. Uh, who knows? the trick by which we can fix this problem. I'm sorry again. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I if I get it. All right, all right. So Yes, you could remove the dependency itself, um, but then, um, like, like you have to to pull for changes in some way, right? Um, but we want it to be explicit, a little bit more explicit. So we want the register patient handler to explicitly say, um, "Add this patient to the repository," and then that will trigger some change calculation. Um, do you know any any other solution there? <laughs> oh, it's it's, uh, it's hard to to. Uh, to here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So um, that the solution is um, uh, to find an abstract thing that is deeper in the application, in a deeper layer. Uh, in this case, a repository interface, uh, which ju just tells us which methods we need to have. Uh, and it, it doesn't tell us anything about uh, the, the, the details that are used to, um, to actually store our data. And then we can have a patient repository which uses MySQL uh, in our infrastructure layer. And it implements the interface from the core, from the domain layer. And so now we have applied dependency inversion. That's a, uh, one of the solid design principles. Um, it tells us to always depend on abstract things or things more abstract instead of more concrete. So we have, we have followed that principle here. And just by introducing an interface, we can invert dependency directions, dependency arrows. And we have now 
uh, followed the dependency rule again. And this brings us one very powerful uh, uh, thing, because now we can solve our previous issue of having very slow tests. All of these slow tests were related to our application talking directly to a database, to the file system, uh, to some other um, server out there uh, over the internet. And now we can, instead of using the, the MySQL repository, we can just provide an in-memory repository, which only keeps the objects in memory and doesn't do any uh, costly uh, operation at all. So this way we can, when running our test suite on the application layer, we can just replace uh, our very slow repository with something that is very fast. Just to make our test suite run very fast, very quickly, um, and that will, of course, make our development flow much better. Um, as Robert Martin says, uh, a good software architecture allows decisions to be deferred and delayed. And this is exactly what we get from introducing interfaces. We can always pick a different implementation, for example, for our database. We can always switch to some, something other, some other uh, storage uh, facility um, at any time, really. Uh, of course, it will be much harder near the end, but at least we can delay uh, our decision and think about it more thoroughly. Uh, maybe discuss something about this with our, our colleagues and uh, exchange some experiences with other teams. We don't need to decide all of this up front. And so, when it comes to uh, even the Symfony framework or Zend or Laravel, anything like that, we can even postpone that decision uh, until we, we, really we are really sure that it's a good fit for our project. So that's a really cool thing. Everything related to uh, the framework, the web framework, or uh, the, the terminal, or the or like the like the co command line interface uh, tools, uh, everything can be de can be de delayed until later, as long as you have put all the focus and energy on creating a good application layer, with inside of it uh, a domain layer. So, in conclusion, what do we get from all of this? We have great separation of concerns, which is something that we want in our architecture. And we want to be able to put things in the right place. Uh, we want to be able to um, make this clear to any of our team members where things belong. And we can just do this based on, uh, on their dependencies. And the way they, they are either talking to the world outside or uh, directed inwards. We have uh, standalone use cases. for If you use commands, then you have extracted them or abstracted them from any HTTP or like other delivery mechanism specific things. Um, sorry, I wanted to say uh, we have our intention back in the code. Instead of having these meaningless controllers which are just copying data to different layers, we have uh, our intention revealing code. And we also have an ability to reuse our functionality. So we have the command handler and we can call it a thousand times with different command messages in the loop. Doesn't really matter. Uh, we don't need to set up a web request object or a form object at all. We can just call the command handler again and again. Then we can have stand-ins, like we have this interface, and we can have a regular implementation, which does the real job, and we can have uh, stand-in, faster implementations. And the funny thing is that hexagonal architecture is mainly uh, a supporting way for your application uh, to, 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 to allow you to apply other techniques or strategies to your uh, development workflow. Um, so, for example, a lot of the testing will be easier and uh, will give you faster feedback. So if you apply a test first using uh, BDD, you, you write the scenarios for your application layer, and then um, you define two uh, different contexts. For example, if you use BHAT, you, uh, you define two contexts. First of all, you can run the application layer without any of the real-world dependencies, and then maybe you run it again, if it's a very crucial part of your application, uh, with all of the user interface and all of the base things uh, enabled. These parts will be much slower, of course, uh, or these tests will be much slower, but they will also be much less in number. Um, one of the uh, interesting articles about this would be a Modeling by Example by Everset. You can uh, follow this link on the slide as well to get there. Um, and the funny thing is that once you, once you have this, you can also um, have smaller units of code uh, at least in your domain layer, you can you can write your domain layer uh, fully test driven. Then, uh, using these scenarios, you can test the application layer in a very thorough way, um, and even still a very fast way. So, um, yeah, 
this this is this is a very great way of uh, creating very uh, stable applications. Then of course DDD is all about that that core part of the application. So of course this architecture is very very much supportive of of that way of looking at things. Uh, also the idea of having uh, bounded contexts greatly corresponds to having uh, all of these little hexagons. If you uh, create all these small applications with just very particular contexts, then uh, they communicate with each other and you will get this whole landscape of um, uh, services, uh, which reminds us maybe of microservices. I'm sure there will be a talk about this um, at this conference. And if you look at the way that uh, I've, I've uh, called uh, these delivery mechanism independent messages, they are commands. And on the other end, you would expect something like queries. Um, if you uh, if you have uh, strictly separated these these uh, actions in your application, then you can also take the step to uh, full CQRS applications. Um, and yeah, there is so much greatness on that road. So um, I would say that uh, any application would at least greatly benefit from applying hexagonal architecture, and at least it lays a big foundation for or a, a very uh, um, thorough and stable foundation for taking other steps in your development process or in your uh, uh, toward a better future of your application. So um, if you have any questions, now would be the time. I think we still have some minutes left. I think no questions then. Um, of course, I will be here uh, at the conference, so you can always get to me personally. Um, also, please leave some feedback uh, on joined in, and you can talk to me on Twitter as well. Uh, oh, I forgot to to add the um, the username here, but all right, it's it's just my first and last name, like in a row. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope it helps. <laughs> thank you.